I'd like to do right now is I'm going to go ahead and introduce our guest speaker. And uh, so this is Kirk Frizz. Uh, we've known each other for several years working out of Spirit and the Metro the Helicopters. And now he's the uh, chief of the Metro. And so I'd like to turn it over to Kirk. He's going to tell you a few things about the helicopter you're going to see here in just a few minutes. Thanks, Dan. Yep. I'll use this so I don't have to yell. Yeah. yeah. Uh, real quick, I won't go over my presentation yet, but what I want to do tonight is, uh, after you look at the aircraft, is talk about the history of airborne law enforcement. When I do that, I'm going to kind of whittle it down to airborne law enforcement in Missouri and then specifically into St. Louis and how it evolved in St. Louis and you know, what we do day in and day out, or what they do now, not me anymore, but uh, what they do day in and day out. So when the helicopter comes in, uh, it's an MD-500. Uh, most of you remember McDonnell Douglas, of course, and so MD nowadays doesn't stand for McDonnell Douglas. It doesn't stand for anything. It's MDHI, uh, MD Helicopters Incorporated. So the way it evolved, Hughes Aircraft Company, uh, they developed the Hughes uh, 300 uh, helicopter, which evolved into the Hughes 500 helicopter. And right when we bought our first uh, turbine aircraft, the Hughes 500, uh, McDonnell Douglas acquired Hughes Aircraft. So they became the MD 500s. So the uh, Metro Air Support Unit, it's called today, uh, flies uh, four MD 500E model helicopters. And uh, we'll get into the engines and specifications and all that as, as deep as you want. And uh, if I tap out, that's because it's a technical question that our mechanic has to answer. I only go so deep into that. I'm fine with my mechanic. So um, uh, when they come in, obviously all the dynamic, any helicopter pilots in there, how many are there? All fixed wing guys? Okay. I'm a fixed wing guy too. I've got about 4,000, over 4,000 hours in helicopters and about 1,000 in fixed wing. So, uh, the, the MD500, it's a five-bladed, fully articulated rotor system, okay? So, meaning there's five blades on top. Those blades flex and, flex and feather independent of each other, giving you a real smooth ride. The difference is, if you've ever flown in a, in a Jet Ranger or a Huey, the big two-bladed rotor systems, and you do that thump, 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 you just kind of bounce along with those big blades because it's a semi-rigid system. It doesn't give you the flex and feathering and give you that nice smooth ride that we get with the MB500. So it's just preference if you want to bounce all day or get a smooth ride. I call it the, uh, the, the Jet Rangers, or like what the media flies mostly around here, Long Rangers. Uh, those are kind of station wagon helicopters. They're great for the media. Uh, the MB500 is a really, really good law enforcement platform. Uh, it's small, it's quick, it's maneuverable. With the five-bladed rotor system, we have smaller blades and not as long. I think it's 26 feet diameter total. So we can put it in some pretty tight spots. Uh, if we had to land on a highway uh, or on a, railroad, on a railroad between trees, we've, we've done that. Uh, uh, we can get it in the pretty tight spots and do some rescue work. But uh, So it's really ideal. We get involved in a lot of pursuits. And the, the quick turning, quick maneuverability, and the increased speed. The problem with like the jet ranges and long range, as soon as you take the doors off, you, uh, you lose a lot of uh, you lose a lot of airspeed because uh, they, they really don't go more than 90 to 100 knots at that point. It's the uh, top recommended speed. We can still do 120 or so if that doors off. And this time of year, that's our air conditioning. So it's the two front doors off. So we don't we don't give up much by taking our doors off. So that's another benefit of the MD500. So it's a really nice law enforcement platform. It, it's a four seater. We don't really haul people. We do take people up for ride alongs, especially police officers. Some government officials, if they need to get up, when, during the floods, all the politicians have to get the picture taken, getting in the helicopters, so act important. Uh, so we do we do that, but for the most part, the aircraft's operated with a pilot and a tactical flight officer. And uh, when you, you know, go out and look at the helicopter, uh, the pilot job's the easy job now. The last couple of years I was flying, I retired from St. Louis County uh, in November of this year when I got hired at Winsville as a chief. So I did 30 years in St. Louis County. And uh, in my 25 years of flying, uh, the, uh, it used to be both jobs were pretty equal. The pilot job was the harder job, obviously. When I started flying, we had a police radio. Uh, the, the tactical flight officer, the, the partner, had to operate a spotlight and, uh, and the infrared system. It was pretty simple. Down, it wasn't real wasn't a lot to it. And if you were in the old Bell 47s, if you remember those, the bubble helicopters, you only had a spotlight and a police radio. It wasn't where anybody could do that. So which, when you go out and look at the aircraft tonight, the pilot job's the easy job now. You know how to fly the thing. And when I got in that helicopter the last couple years, I didn't even want anything to do with that right seat. 
because it's too technical now for me. Uh, it's, I want to fly. That's all I want to do. Because when you go in there, you're going to see a flat screen. It's really, depending on which aircraft they bring tonight, it's a really long flat screen. It's a double screen. Uh, they have a moving map system now. Uh, and they also have a, uh, a for, the forward-looking infrared, which is also a live time camera. So in the daytime, you can op op opt to use the, the real live video, or you can flip the infrared mode. Mostly at night, they're using infrared mode. And then the, the place radios in and of themselves. So let's go for about, we just got a whole new radio system for 911 and everything in St. Louis County. $100 million tax uh, bond issue. Everybody passed a couple years ago. It's built. And uh, so they called me. I was still the commander when they said, all right, we're, we're ordering police radios, the walkie-talkies, radios for the cars, uh, and then uh, we want to get the helicopters equipped. How much are your radios? How much are the radios? So we did the research on what was compatible and what we need. And uh, so I called them back and I said, $40,000. We go, that's not bad at all. I said, a piece. Yeah. Each. Yeah. <laughs> so they go, oh, how many do you need? I said, well, we need six. I said, actually, we need seven. We have, we have six aircraft. We need a spare. So I said, it's going to break. And uh, so we bought seven of them at $40,000 a piece. So, but these radios, we talk to every, we can talk to everybody and anybody. On the, the old radio system, we could talk, we couldn't talk to St. Louis City Police. We couldn't talk to the Highway Patrol. We could talk to some municipalities, depending if they were uh, UHF, VHF, or uh, some of them were uh, 800 band. You know, so it got really complicated. Now everybody's on the same system, but they got all these zones. And so now at the Metro Air Support Unit, you know, we patrol St. Louis City, St. Louis County, and St. Charles County. And then all the jurisdictions, all the different departments within that. And so in police work in St. Louis County, which has been in the news the last couple of years, about 57 police departments, 30 of those police parts had their own communication centers. So before, we couldn't talk to them. So now the, the aircraft can talk to anybody. But the, the observer, the TFO in the aircraft, has to know how to work that radio. Yes, there's all kinds of different zones. you got to talk to fire, EMS. Uh, so if we get in a pursuit down in the city, they want to be able to turn quickly turn off St. Charles County, St. Louis County. And uh, I watched them work that, that thing, and I was like, yeah, thank God I'm flying. That's yeah, pretty complicated. And then to watch these guys manipulate that moving map system and the infrared system all at once. And then we have a, we just recently purchased a slaving unit that ties the infrared camera, the 30 million candle power spotlight. It ties it all together. Because back in the old days when I was flying, you'd go from infrared to camera, or I'm sorry, infrared to, to night sun, a big spotlight, and then you, you, you would lose yourself. So like, where, where's my spotlight face? I don't, I don't even know. Now they follow each other. So they, we've got a, a slaving device. That was $10,000 a piece. Uh, so it, it ties it all together. So if you have to go in the cockpit into your infrared screen, then you can, you're not losing your spotlight. Wherever you move the infrared, you, uh, your night sun is following. You may turn it off, but as long as you leave it motored up, it's still following. So when you go out and look at the aircraft, on the right side of the helicopter, you're going to see the, the, the big spotlight hanging out there. That's 30, min, 30 million candle power. Okay. So it's, it's a pretty bright light. The, well, I can tell you this, uh, it's about $2,000 a light bulb. Yeah, and we, just bought, we just bought all new lights a couple years ago. Uh, I want to say about $15,000 a light. Now, a lot of this, what we did is when I get into my presentation, I'm going to talk about, as we formed Metro Air Support from the old St. Louis County Police Flight Operations Unit, uh, it really opened the floodgate for Homeland Security money post 9-11. Post Homeland Security money. And I'm going to talk about why the regionalism of the air support assets for law enforcement in the St. Louis area was so important and, uh, and how we capitalized on that. And a lot of the equipment uh, that we, we got is, is federal government um, grant money. So two new helicopters um, and then all the equipment, all the new radio equipment, uh, new mapping systems. It's all been upgraded with uh, Homeland Security money again post 9-11 because one of the things we can do a lot of the critical infrastructure in the St. Louis area, uh, the water plants are under the waterways, the rivers, the, a lot of electrical plants, patrol cars can't see those from where they're at on the, on the, on the roadways. They can't, they can't patrol those. We can't from the air. So we work uh, directly with the, uh, the Coast Guard assets they have on the river, on the riverfront. We help them out. They help fund uh, some of our new equipment with port security grants. The last aircraft, the last development we bought was through the port security grants. But uh, so that was uh, that federal grant money has been really important to us building this, the unit to, to 
the shape it's in today, which is it's in really good shape. So the work these guys are doing with the aircraft and the equipment you're going to see in it. When you look at the, on the uh, the left side of the cockpit, it's it's the pilot. You know, he's got what he needs. It's still the old dials are getting ready to go to glass cockpits here next year. The federal government uh, is paying for that as well. They uh, we put in for a grant to uh, I can't remember what system we're getting. Uh, but it'll be a glass cockpit, so all the gas gauges will be out of it. Uh, they're not instrument rated aircraft at this time, but uh, a lot of our pilots will get, we're encouraging to get their instrument rating because we do fly in a lot of tricky weather, and it's just a survival thing of uh, if you get in that IMC, is being able to get out of it. So we do quite a bit of simulator training. The Highway Patrol bought a really nice uh, flight simulator they keep over in their hangar in Jeff City. So it, it's a 30 minute flight. We can go over there, train for a couple hours on their simulator. And, um, and then fly back. So it's, uh, it's, it's a good asset. That, they purchased that with federal grant money. The nice thing about those grant funds is when someone asks if they can use it, another agency, they can't say no. So the we patrol St. Louis City, St. Louis County, St. Charles County, but if St. Clair County, Illinois calls us, if it's a life-threatening situation, we got to go. And we do. Now, if they're, if they're looking for something that's you know a lost dog or something, if it's a life-threatening situation, we go because we're good neighbors, but we also can't say no because of all the federal grant funding. So they're part of what we call the UNSC, it's an urban area initiative, uh, all the post-9-11 uh, grant funding that came down for firefighters and, and law enforcement. So, so when you look at the aircraft, if you're familiar with helicopters, um, the right side of the helicopter's got all the police equipment in it. The left side is just the pilot seat. Uh, they carry, underneath there's going to be a cargo hook. We do some light rescue work. I'm going to talk about that in the presentation. So she slides of us doing some rescue work. And uh, there's there's some very basic rescue equipment. Uh, we do keep a Billy Pew net, a two-man net at the back of the hangar. We have done rescues with that in the past. We do skin insertions with our SWAT guys in firefighters. We do water rescues and high-rise rescues. So uh, and I'll show you pictures of all that stuff. Uh, there's a reason we've stuck with the platform we stuck with. Uh, we're trying to keep the the maintenance, we have in-house in maintenance. We, we employ two mechanics. And uh, we, we looked at buying true rescue helicopters, or at least one. And uh, we did, we did an analysis, cost analysis on it. Really no more than we were going to be able to fly it. And then the, the maintenance and the tooling, it was going to be a little tricky. It was really going to break our budget from what we do. And our, our bread and butter is proactive patrols. These guys go out every day and they patrol just like officers do in the police cars. So they're there required to fly four hours out of their eight-hour shift. They need to be in the air. Most of them will fly between four and six. So uh, uh, they, they can get a lot of flying time. So and then there's always a training component going on with that. And right now they have 11 officers assigned to the unit. Uh, I can't remember right now how many are actually uh, PIC status, but they're either PIC status or they're in sub-stage of training uh, as they go on. So when you look at the air helicopter, you'll see the, the, the hook on the bottom, the night sun, on the very front of the helicopter, you're going to see a black ball. Uh, it's going to be the, the infrared system. Okay, there are lots of other relatively new systems. It's the, uh, the FLIR 7500s, I believe now, and uh, they're, they give us a great picture. You know, so, uh, like, like I said, it's make it turns nighttime into daylight for us. You know, we can, there's pretty much this time of year, if we're looking for someone in the woods, the foliage will kind of block us out. But if we can get the guy moving, uh, we'll get, we'll pick up the body heat between the breaks of the trees. And I'll show you a video, a good video of, a, of an agency down in Texas that does a really good job with their infrared, going from live camera to infrared mode and spotlight all at the same time. And it's, it's just a minute and a half demonstration of really using the system. And that's what these guys do every day. We've had a lot of good apprehensions with our helicopter, bank robbers, a lot of good bank robbers uh, as far as chases. Chases from helicopters are really pretty cool. And I'll tell you, with the policy of every Police do well, okay, I won't say that, I'll step back. Not every police department. Every professional police agency in the region has a policy of using the helicopter, or at least requesting the aircraft, if they get in a vehicle pursuit. If the aircraft gets on scene, all ground units are to back off. And, uh, and then the helicopter takes, ov takes over. Hopefully the ground units out of sight, out of mind, the bad guys slow down. Most of the time what we find out is they, they don't see anything in the rearview mirror, they stop and bail out, and we'll chase them on foot all day long. But it's really fun to watch these guys hit spike strips, and they'll still drive on the rims, and sparks flying everywhere. And uh, so I, you see a lot of really, really neat things from the air. So, I'm sorry. The the, uh, the infrared systems are about 400,000 now. So we bought our first one in 19, 
89, and it was on 200,000 then. And, uh, and we, we buy, ours isn't real fancy, it's not HD, and it's the one that the media is using. When you watch Channel 2, Channel 4, Channel 5 in the morning, that nice picture you see of traffic, those are, those are almost million dollar cameras. So, uh, but they can afford it, they're a for profit company, and we, we can't. So we beg, borrow, and steal federal funding to do ours or ask the coach to come. So ours are about $450,000 right now, which ironically was the cost of the first helicopter, first turbine helicopter we bought. Back in 1985, it was $450,000. So now that the two, the two newest helicopters we bought in 2010 and 2012 were $2 million each. No, no, we had to, we had to piece of that. No, that's for the aircraft. Uh, we put, it didn't include infrared system, movie map system, uh, night sun, any, any of that, police radios. No, we, had to, we had to have all that. We, and we did. We just transferred it from one aircraft to another. But uh, the, two, the first two MD500s we bought uh, in 1985 and 87, we were still flying. They're just a little bit prettier. We came. And then we bought the, the newer ones in 2010 and, and uh, 2012. That's a good question. Do we carry any weapons as police officers other than is the, the aircraft armed? And the, the answer is no. Uh, there is, we, we carry our, our guns, we carry as police officers, our, our pistols. There is an airborne, uh, airborne law enforcement use of force policy out there, model policy. Now, we've made the conscious decision that we would never do that, especially from the MD500. It's not a real stable platform to take a precision shot. Uh, LA SWAT, LA County SWAT, line bigger aircraft. Uh, they got a sta more stable platform. They train it a lot, and they do it. Uh, Texas DPS has actually used it. Uh, people come across the border, and uh, they got it to, they were firing at the aircraft, so they fired back. They got a 50 cal on one of their, uh, uh, they, they bought the big uh, uh, 350, Eurocopter 350, I think, whatever it is, the big, the big helicopter. They got a 50 cal, they lit it up. They shot at the back of the, uh, the truck bed, and it was covered, and it was back on sardines, and they killed a couple people in it. Uh, but it was a justified use of force, and, uh, but they do train airborne use of force. And ironically, the way they train is they go out to those 20,000 acre ranches, and they do some hog uh, control. The wild boar honey down there, that gives them some live fire practice. So, and it helps the agriculture department on maintaining the, uh, the boar population. So, so, yeah, so we don't shoot from the helicopter. Uh, some departments do, but we don't. Okay? So you ever have to fly in the Are you asking if we get out of the helicopter and chase the finish chase? Well, then we take the advantage of us being up here, and we, we like to take command and control from up here and direct the officers to the scene and direct them. I, I have one time jumped out of the helicopter. And that was because an officer, it was a, it really, it was at the LaCoyne on McDonald 270. And my partner uh, landed, I said, the, the officer said, it, he's walking back to the patrol car and he said, everything's under control. And as I'm, as I'm, uh, we're, he's, we're starting to turn away, my partner's starting to turn away. I said, no, no, it's not. And he doesn't hear me on the radio. And they, the guy was running up, two guys were running up behind him. So, you know, when we landed on a parking lot, we cleaned it off. And so we basically air blasted that guy, the two bad guys back. And I did jump out of the helicopter and uh, help catch one guy. And the ground officer got together. But for the most part, the rule is you stay up in the air. Because that's, that's why you're up there for that, you know, 500 foot view to, to take command and control and control the situation. But uh, there are very rare circumstances. I know I've jumped out one time. So and 25 years of flying. But, uh, that was because an officer. Well, I also saw we had a good foot pursuit up in North County. Uh, bank robbery suspect. He was all over the Bell Fountain Road. There's some farmland or open field called farmland. And uh, finally caught the bad guy. And they, so we asked the dispatcher to do a roll call uh, because we had Bell Fountain officers. We had all of North County up there, St. Louis County officers. And a couple of officers weren't answering the radio. So we thought, okay, let's go check the field with a foot pursuit. Man. And uh, I was flying. My partner's looking. And we saw that we, we County Brown wears light brown shirts. 
face down in the field. I saw a police officer sprawled out face down. So we could see Christian Northeast, you know, as, as the helicopter flies. It was 10 seconds. But the problem was, we got to thinking about it real quick. An ambulance is going to go all the way around the Belfont Road, and then they're going to have to walk into the field. There's was going to be a 20-minute, 30-minute response for them to actually get to them. So I told my partner, I said, go, go get them. So we landed, and uh, a couple of officers picked him up. He's having a heart attack. Picked him up, got him in the back of the helicopter. I radioed the ER room, or the dispatcher called the ER, and we're coming into Halifax to drop off an uh, officer cardiac arrest. So we got him in there, and uh, he lived. So, uh, so there, are, there are circumstances there that will we'll break what our normal protocols are and, uh, and do things like that. We had a big flood, flash flood years ago down in St. Francis County. We went down, a van went across the, uh, the, the washout. The thing you hear every spring in the news, don't do that, but everybody does. People do, not everybody. This van went across and it tumbled and people, several people got out, two people did not. One body they found, it washed up on the shore, and uh, the other one they found three days later. So we were down there for the initial search, and we actually, it was swollen so much, the creek, EMS, fire, and everybody was on one side of the creek. And they, they had no way to get to the other side. Some of these people were injured that got out of the van. So we flew them. We ferried them back. And one guy was dead that they pulled out. So we ferried the injured over, and then we loaded up the, uh, the, the dead guy in the back of the helicopter. We ferried him over real quick. Uh, that way he just wasn't laying out there. And then we came back the next couple of days, and they finally found the, the other gentleman washed away down close to this city. But uh, it's things like that. We will, you know, we take out back seats and, we, have quick, we can rip the back seats out pretty quick and throw some stuff in and you know, people do what we need to do. So there are those circumstances. So. Uh, I'm curious, Kurt. Uh, how much of the uh, flight and proficiency training is done with the 500s, or is it all done with the loaches? It's well, that's a good question. We have so we have we have two loaches, 086s, military surplus. Actually, we're on one, we just killed one. It's, uh, they're parked out now. So we have one remaining. We, we really like to train in the loaches. They're really fun to fly, and they're, it's, a lot, it's a little bit cheaper to fly in them. Uh, believe it or not, the one that's still left is the first one we got in 1996. And, uh, it's, uh, but, and we've had, we had, one time we had four of them. And uh, they're great training aircraft. It saves the uh, MD 500s for patrol work. They've got all the higher price equipment on them. The, all the loaches have the low skid gear. So, uh, we do fly them for daytime patrol, but uh, we won't use them at night because we don't put infrared systems on them. We don't put the night sun. So we use them primarily as a trainer. But with that, uh, all, the, all the initial, for your private rating, it has to be in a certified aircraft. The loaches are not certified aircraft. So the initial training for the private rating has to be done in a certified aircraft, so it's done in the MB-500. And then for commercial and all recurrent training is done in the loaches. But I don't think... The current, the last one we have, will probably maybe another year and it'll be out. We won't. Uh, we're out of engines. We had a whole coffin. We had a whole wall full of engine coffins that we got from the military. And we, I think we burned them all up now. So that white one's still flying. That white one's the only one left. Yeah, <laughs> that's the first one we got. So um, I'll tell you what. Let me get to my presentation about what I'm going to do. Is I'm going to walk you through kind of a, a real touch on the whole history of airborne law enforcement in the United States, how it started. How it's evolved, it's really quick. And then um, we'll really localize it into Missouri. Missouri's had a lot of influence in, uh, in, the, in the formation of the Airborne Law Enforcement. The last four years, I was president of the Airborne Law Enforcement Association, which I'll talk a little bit about. I'm not currently the immediate past president. And, uh, but the Airborne Law Enforcement Association really was started here in Missouri. And uh, in the first two, uh, first two safety seminars were held, held here in St. Louis. So uh, I'll get into that. Um, yeah, we don't have a remote. Albert, do we have a remote? Uh, 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 we're just hitting the inner button. No, I'm just on your computer. Yeah, okay. So when I got some, I'm going to have some pictures of some yeah. early fixed wings. It really started off as an early fixed wing. The whole, the international beginning of uh, airborne law enforcement actually started with uh, the. Uh, Line of the air, the balloons, the, uh, uh, the airships. Oh, okay. Well, that's okay. I, 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 so you'll 
You'll see some aircraft. You want to know what they are? If you don't know, I don't know either on most of them. So, <laughs> but, uh, that is uh, New York Police Department there. So the earliest known uh, uh, use of law enforcement by aircraft in the United States was 1914, the Miami Police Department. And it was a Curtis uh, flying boat. And, and here, the story behind it was there was a jewelry thief, robbed a hotel of uh, thousands, of do thousands of dollars worth of jewelry, got out onto a ship. Uh, somehow they got word he was on the ship, but they didn't know how to get out to it. They uh, contacted a guy that owned the, owned the, uh, the uh, flying boat. And they said, can you fly us out to that ship? So a couple of police officers got in the airplane, and he flew them out there, and then they flew the bad guy back. So that's the first known use of, by law enforcement. Uh, so it's just over 100 years. Then uh, NYPD uh, in 1929 started it. And really, if you look at that, uh, it was really started to target barnstormers back in the early days of aviation. So if you can imagine, in New York, their, their, their biggest concern at the time was barnstorming. Well, then, if you think about it, what's going on at the same time as the advent of the automobile. They're really starting to become uh, more and more on the roads. So then they realized there was a secondary benefit to traffic control or traffic monitoring uh, for traffic jams. Uh, so they, or, or the new phenomenon called traffic jams. So that's what they realized is a secondary benefit to other than barnstorming for aircraft. And that's an NYPD uh, flight crew in 1929. And then uh, they got into the helicopter business in uh, the late 50s. I think it was 1957. And that was really, I think that was the last time they, they used fixed wing. And after that, they moved strictly over to uh, fixed wing assets. Los Angeles County uh, Sheriff's Department, uh, they started a Sheriff's Aero Squadron in uh, the late 1920s. They had five volunteers uh, who owned their own uh, bi-wing airplanes. Uh, two, and, and some of you may, any former TWA employees here, pilots, or okay. Uh, two of the volunteer deputies were Jack Fry and uh, Paul Richard. And they, they have to be the, also the co-founders of uh, TWA, uh, so years later. So today, uh, the LA County Sheriff's Department, I've been out to LA County, I've flown with them. Larry, have you flown to LA County? Larry's been around all the, uh, he knows the airborne law enforcement world as well as I do. Uh, they're flying uh, 15 uh, A-Star B-3s, uh, three Super Pumas. I can't remember the price tag on those. Yeah, what's that? On Super Pumas? Three million. Oh, they got to be like 15 million. Oh, the dress out. Oh, the dress out was three. Okay. Is that right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're impressive aircraft. But... They, they got two Cessnas they use as surveillance aircraft and uh, transport, and then one King Air. Now, what's dynamic about LA County, if you think about it, they got the massive uh, LA Basin they patrol, and then of course there's also LA City Police, and they, they patrol the municipal limits of LA, you know, population 3 million, uh, but it's, it's metropolitan. LA County has got several thousand square miles, and they've got mountains, and they've got ocean. They've got an island, a couple islands offshore that they, is in their jurisdiction, and then they got the populated areas. So they started a, found, uh, a program called the Rescue 5 uh, program. They actually have a not-for-profit foundation, which I'm going to talk about later because it gave us an idea here of something we could do. But uh, they've got a Rescue 5. They used to fly the old Sea Kings uh, aircraft, and they've recently replaced those with the, uh, the Super Pumas. So that, that's the A-Stars are flying out of the B-3s. Uh, like I said, they got 15 of those. And there's a Super Puma they're flying today, a true rescue aircraft. In the, in the 60s, it re, it, airborne law enforcement, now, you think about what's going on in the 60s. Uh, it's post-Korean War. In Korean War, we saw the onset of uh, use of helicopters. And, uh, and in the mid-60s, you got the Vietnam War going on where you really saw a proliferation of helicopters used. And so uh, the federal government started the Law Enforcement Act which uh, provided grant funding and uh, military surplus, because a lot of the, uh, the OH-6s, the OH-58s uh, were coming back from Vietnam that were uh, out of service for them, but still usable for civilian law enforcement. They realized there's still a good purpose for these aircraft, and they could transfer them over to law enforcement. But uh, secondarily to that, they also started providing some grant funding in, in the form of block grants for law enforcement to start forming uh, aerial patrol units. So the, the very first one was the Sky Knight program 
out in uh, L.A. County, but it was in uh, the municipality of Lakewood, California. And so I think in L.A. County, they probably have three or four different air support units. There are several smaller municipalities that operate their own aircraft units. And they, they, it works for them. It, uh, cooperative, it works. They, handle, they got a good handoff system for pursuits and things they get into. But L.A. County is the big guy. But Lakewood, California, in 1965, started the Sky Night program. Uh, their aircraft they chose, and it was all federally funded with the Law Enforcement Act, was the Hughes 300. And that, the, the, the Hughes 300, um, Schweitzer 300 today, as you, you would know it. And then a spinoff of that, Kansas City, Missouri Police Department, 1967, uh, the chief over there was a guy named Clarence Kell Kelly. Everybody ever hear of him? He ended up becoming the FBI director. So Clarence Kelly was a, a longtime FBI director for the CIA. I don't know. But uh, impressive guy. But he was the Kansas City, Missouri chief. He saw what they were doing with the Sky Knight program. So in 1967, he started a project called, uh, a program called Project 67. He just wanted to try an aircraft pilot program for several months during 1967. They, they put the aircraft at 500 feet. At certain, they wanted to fly at a certain amount of uh, miles per hour certain neighborhoods based on crime trends, and they wanted to see if they could have an impact. So they put it over high crime areas, just with burglaries and robberies, to see if they could truly measure the effect of the aircraft. Uh, and obviously their, their hypothesis was it's a force multiplier. Uh, you know, it's going to make the bad guy a little more paranoid to the police are up there and the police are out there on the ground as well. So uh, they measured this. They also selected the Hughes 300 because it was working out in California. So they were flying the Hughes 300 aircraft. And it worked, and in 1968, they established a full-time air support unit in Kansas City. And, and they're still operating, uh, much like we do. They, they're in the MB-500s as well. Uh, shortly after that, Missouri State Highway Patrol started uh, acquiring aircraft and flying around the state of Missouri. Uh, I'm not really sure. I know they were flying Bell 47s and then mostly fixed wing. Then they evolved into Jet Rangers. Uh, I think it was the late 70s or early 80s they started evolving into the Jet Rangers. But, uh, and then St. Louis County established their first air support unit, flight unit, in 1971 with military surplus Bell 47s. Uh, the Airborne Law Enforcement Association, which I mentioned I'm, I'm, I'm a part of, uh, was, uh, it's interesting, I didn't realize until I started really looking at the history of the ALEA. We've got a, a gentleman over in St. Joe, uh, uh, Don Bacali just wrote kind of a history of ALEA. He's been involved in it from the very early days. The very first, I got a good picture of me when I was president last year, and the very first president, which is Jack Brady, who's a captain of the Kansas City Police Department. He was the very first president. He's still around, uh, uh, very sharp guy. He's actually gave a little talk at the conference a couple years ago. But uh, so the ALEA was loosely formed in 1968. They had they had all these police pilots around the Midwest. Kentucky was there, and I think Tennessee, Ohio, uh, Missouri. They decided, let's, let's have a safety seminar, let's meet in the middle and talk about airborne law enforcement because we're just trying to create this thing. We've got to figure out what we're doing. So they met here in 68 and 69. It was really led by the Missouri Highway Patrol. Uh, I, I used to know all the names, all the players involved in the Highway Patrol. And Kansas City PD, which was Captain Jack Brady. And then uh, in 1969, they incorporated uh, as, a, as the Airborne Law Enforcement Association. For a lot of, for a lot of years, it, today the uh, ALEA is, has 3,500 members uh, worldwide. Uh, six regional safety seminars held it, uh, annually. There's an annual conference uh, I'll be at next month in uh, Savannah, Georgia. Uh, recently, very recently, last couple of years, last year I traveled over to Belgium, Brussels, Belgium, and we try to have cons the Police Aviation Conference for Europe. That right now, they're actually over there in Germany at PAFCON. Uh, we gave a presentation last year over Brussels saying they wanted to see how ALEA does it because they're starting to lose interest in airborne law enforcement in the European countries. So we showed them how we do our training. And uh, the way they do it is 20, 30 minute presentations, and then there's a commercial. It's like if some guy comes over and gives a 15 minute sales pitch, and then another 20 minute presentation. Well, you can't learn a whole lot in 20 minutes about tactics and safety and, and all the things that go into having a safe operation. So they invited us over two years ago to, to present and said, would you run our, our conference for us? Do it your style. And there were some cultural barriers. And it took them a while to get used to because, you know, we in the United States, we talk, for, we talk for almost an hour straight before we take a break. 
you know, in the police world, it's 15 minutes to an hour and you got to take a break. So we gave them that and they ate it up. And it's also when they, when they do their presentation, it's the presenter talking to them. They don't talk back. So ours are more open forum. It's, it's give and take. Ask questions. You know, ask me. I'm, I'm the subject matter expert on whatever I'm talking about. Say our safety guy or, uh, you know, we're talking about IMC. We'll have that expert up there. Whatever component we're talking about, we encouraged it. And they, they, they really caught them off guard. But once they got through the first couple of sessions, they got it. And I think they realized they had all these pent-up questions that they couldn't ask for all these years. So uh, as of this year, we're actually running their PAFCON conference. Because PAFCON was dying. So PAFCON is becoming part of ALEA. We actually see that as going to be our seventh region. And we're going to have an ALEA European region here very soon. So, And we're also working with the country of Brazil. They're flying very loosely in the, air, the airborne law enforcement world. They've been coming to our annual conference. We had some of our uh, key instructors down there last spring at their they're trying to form a, an association. We said, hey, we kind of got this thing figured out since 1969. Why don't you take a look? They came up. They liked what they saw. So now we're sending people down to Brazil to help train and train their trainers. We're trying to give them ownership, but I think we're a couple of years away from a South American uh, region for ALEA. So it's truly gone international. Uh, it used to be international for us with Canada. You know, that's like a suburb of the United States. So, um, so we're really expanding the ALEA. It's really taken off for us in, in a lot of ways. Uh, we're, we keep, keep trying to promote and retain our membership in the United States. Uh, we have good corporate partners. Uh, uh, and I keep picking on Larry Corbett, who's been a good corporate member of the uh, ALEA for a lot of years. So now to take this down to the Airborne Law Enforcement in St. Louis and uh, what we've had established here. Like I said, in 1971, uh, St. Louis County Police uh, formed the uh, uh, Flight Operations Unit. They acquired three military surplus Bell 47 helicopters, uh, and they took, they weren't all Vietnam veteran pilots. There were several of them that were, and then they brought a couple of police officers. They got trained up. Uh, Terry Weiland was one of the original pilots. Uh, Dave Knive, and uh, I, I, I was hoping to get some pictures up in here. I, I try to technically challenge on some of this stuff with PowerPoint, but I couldn't, there's, I got some really good pictures of uh, a lot of the original pilots and a lot of the original flight operations. But they moved around quite a bit. The original operation, they, they moved into a trailer out in Spirit Airport originally. And then uh, they were there for a year or two. They moved over to Mark Arrow at Lambert Airport. And then they relocated to Arrowhead Airport. Uh, they, they coexisted with St. Louis Helicopter. And then, uh, then they, in 1981, the county police built, uh, built the hangar uh, that we're currently in uh, right there on the TAC Air flight line. Uh, interesting thing about that, until, until the last couple of years, that was the only building the St. Louis County Police owned. Uh, every other building is either county government owned or leased. So all the precinct stations are leased buildings. They just recently built a new South County precinct station. So for a lot of years, that was the only building the county police owned. Uh, we've really, the county police, or the Metro Air Support Union now, as it's known, I'm going to get into that, has really outgrown that building. Uh, the SWAT teams moved in there. Uh, it was really built for the two-bladed rotor systems. So we get a lot of hangar rash, moving aircraft around. Uh, we can't. We used to be able to get our fixed wing in there. We can't anymore. It's over in the county, in the county T hangars now, on the west side of the airport. So uh, we're trying to get out of that building. We came really close a year ago. Uh, we're looking at. We'd like to build on the north side of the airport. We'd like to get out Tack Air's way. Uh, and they built that airport or that hangar in 1981. Think about Spirit Airport back then. It was one runway. Uh, it wasn't real busy. Uh, it was just a reliever airport wasn't the business airport that it is today. Uh, but we had to build in the sets a couple years ago because I, I said, I think this is like lakefront property. You know, it, it's too small to do a lot of things with that they need uh, attack air needs, but they can keep their trailers and some of their support vehicles in it or something. So we got it, we got it assessed and uh, when the county realized they're sitting on some money there, they could probably sell it and build a new hangar either on the north side of the field or off site somewhere. And uh, it's still come out ahead with a couple pennies in their pocket. So they're still trying to evaluate how to get out of that building. Uh, TAC Air is very generous. We drive across their ramp. You know, we have police cars. My guys stand how many times a day going in and out of there. Very well protected. Yeah, yeah, very well protected. We have a SWAT team going in and out of there. It's, uh, we haven't run into an airplane yet, but uh, there's a lot of jets out there nowadays. So those are three of the, uh, I, don't, I can't tell you these are three of the original ones. Uh, 
2251 whiskey was the last one we had. That's the one I actually trained in in 1990. Uh, after we bought the turbine aircraft, we kept one uh, Bell 47 for training. When I started training in 1990, I trained in the last one that the county had. They flew until 1993. And then uh, we balled it up. So, training accident. So, a couple of the original pilots. Uh, So they, they've operated as a full-time flight operations ever since 1971, uh, which has been a very, a lot of agencies are, a lot of this, there's about 300 airborne law enforcement units or police departments around the country flying to one. You've got the NYPDs and the LAPDs, LA counties in the world. Then you have us. I consider us a medium to large operation considering the number of aircraft and the number of hours we're flying. And then you've got small operations, one, air, one helicopter or two, and they're flying part-time with a pilot or two. Uh, so then there's a whole bunch of those sheriff's department, rural sheriff's departments. They got of that. They got a military surplus aircraft, and they fly it when they can. When they got a few bucks to put gas in the tank and do a little bit of maintenance for a lot of those operations. So when I say there's 300 airborne law enforcement units in the country, uh, you figure 50 states. What's the difference? So come November, we had this thing figured out. The media is mad at us uh, because they thought we tried to keep them out, which we really did. They, they could go up to about 3,000 feet, and they were cameras. They could get it. It was working. Uh, but the media was mad. It wasn't even the pilots were mad. It was the editors, the bosses were mad. So they were filing a lawsuit on us. And we had to, we had, so the, during the November riots, uh, we had planned this out. Washington, D.C. actually came in, the real FAA guys, and they set up shop in our, they had a whole table at our emergency operations center. They took control of the airspace. And they said, well, if the media's not happy with what you did in August, they're really not going to be happy with what we do in November. And uh, because what, what we had in November, is we had 26, we had 18 authorized aircraft to fly. What was flying in the air was Metro Air Support doing the low level police work. You had FBI flying at six, somewhere up here, 6,000 feet. And what I, I can, I'm not supposed to tell you the official altitude, but the FBI had their Night Stalker. Uh, it's a, it's a uh, citation jet. Uh, I, I agree. Because they were never officially there, but they said you could tell them we were there, but don't tell them what our altitude was. Because they were they were downlinking to our command post, and they were a phenomenal asset force. Uh, but they were flying, I could say, north of 18,000 feet. So, but I can't tell you exactly where they were flying. It was north of 18,000. So they were a very useful force. So, and then we had uh, some National Guard aircraft that were coming. They brought in for medical evac for first responders that were on standby. They kept them out of spirit to fly in and take any first responder that went down. So there was all kinds of things in the air world going on with Ferguson. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, not not during Ferguson. So there's been there's usually a couple of aircraft around the country that law enforcement get shot during the year. Highway Patrol got shot a few years ago out on a bank robbery deal. Uh, usually it's because you're flying too low. You know, the, we try to keep our heads out of the police world and keep it up here in the command world and observation world. But every now and then, the true blood of a police officer will come in, you think you got to get down in the fight. You know, we're not down in the fight, we need to be up here. So we remind our pilots that, hey, keep your altitude. You know? so. I'm trying to remember, um, I want to say the gentleman out in the golf course of Baldwin was shooting at 308. Uh, I don't know for sure the, now here's how close the highway patrol got to the one in central Missouri. He was shooting a shotgun. Yeah, he got hit. Not only did the aircraft got hit, he got hit too. So how close do you have to be for that? You know, so, yeah. He was low, doors off, he got shot in the leg with a shotgun. You know, so that's getting, that's getting down in the fight in the airborne law enforcement world. That's not what we do nowadays. That's why I said some agencies have been slower to evolve, uh, but we're, we're evolving. So, okay. yeah, that's, that's getting down in the weeds. Yeah. We, we tell our guys uh, uh, 500 feet AGL. At, at night, it's usually 7 to 800 AGL. So, uh, you know, altitude's your friend, of course, so the higher the better. With the optics and the equipment we have now, there's no reason they need to be that low. You know, the higher that you can see more when you're higher. So, especially with the camera systems. And now the night vision goggles. Just don't need to be that low. I mean, they're, they're doing a good job at that. So, so 
question. Yes, sir. County ground. So that's a good question. I'm glad you asked that. And that's fun. Um, so what happened? We had the county ground helicopter. So we merged with St. Louis City and St. Charles County. So St. Charles County was kind of sheriff tan. We're county brown and the city's blue. So we have brown helicopters. And uh, Chief Boqua, I remember Chief Boqua down in the city, he used to just, when he'd see that brown helicopter in the city, it just, he didn't like it. So uh, one day we got a UPS delivery and uh, it, the big brown truck pulled up. So uh, I took a picture. I had him pull up by the helicopter, so I sent him a, a picture. I said, "What can Brown do for you, Chief?" And uh, so, <laughs> so, so the way it worked, I was the commander of the unit. So what, what we decided, what we we're going to do, is come up with a law enforcement neutral. They're blue, we're brown, they're tan. We need a law enforcement neutral scheme. So uh, we decided with the black and white, and that black and white, um, M MD, MD has a standard paint scheme, the striping and things like that. They're usually pretty ugly. So I wanted to do something different. So we used uh, AFS, uh, the, fil the filter system. They've, they've been bought out since. AFS graphic designer said, so come up with something for us, you know, uh, using our helicopter. So they actually came up with that. Now when we got it, they actually kind of, like, we started to think about a kid's program where they could name it because we knew the name was going to be Shamu because it looks like a whale when you get the doors on, you know. So, uh, but that's where that it came from, a graphic designer from AFS, the filter company. And uh, as a law enforcement do, everybody gets black and white law enforcement, so that's why we look at that. So. My other quick question is, I'm wondering whether or not the uh, uh, county air, St. Louis County Air Operation Unit operates independently at all, or it's entirely integrated? It's entirely integrated. So, that's all, all these are owned by the St. Louis County Police. Uh, even the grant-funded air helicopters, a police department had to sign for them. The county police were the only ones that could had capital to back it up and say we can provide maintenance and sustain it. If, if the Metro Air Support Unit dissolves, we can still sustain this. So the, everything is owned by the St. Louis County Police. There, and this was my goal because we had all the pilots. No one else had any pilots. St. Louis City had one pilot, and when he came in, he didn't work out so well. Um, and so they, they brought another guy in. So we trained all their people now. So my goal was it doesn't matter who's in the helicopter. It can be a St. Charles County pilot or in a city TFO. Uh, there's oftentimes, there's not even a county police officer in that helicopter. And that's the way it's supposed to work, a seamless operation. So it doesn't matter. It's, it, basically, they've got the four city pilots, four county pilots, the two St. Charles County pilots. The schedule falls and the schedule falls. Partners are partners. And it's their shift. It doesn't matter what department they're from. The overall commander of uh, Metro is a uh, St. Louis County captain. St. Louis County police captain. I, I, that's why I got, I got to do that for 10 years. I left the unit in 2010. They let me keep flying until I retired November 1st, and I did my last flight right at the end of October. So, so yeah, they let me stay involved as kind of a reserve pilot. So. Kurt, do you see the, this platform working for you guys for several years to come? If MD survives, because they don't have any air assets up here. We are the Coast Guard air assets for this part of the uh, That is so States. cool. Look at that. Because all theirs are down at the uh, other end of the Mississippi River down on the golf. So, yeah, that's us. So when aircraft's coming in, you want to watch land. And as soon as they stop it, the blade stops, they have to go out and That is so cool. Yeah, that is so cool.